Hi, I'm Adam and welcome back to First Man Photography. In the photography world, there is no shortage of people ready to dish out criticism, serve up harsh comments and put you down at the first chance they get. I know a lot of you struggle with this and it even prevents some of you from sharing your work at all. So in this video, we're going to stick it to the haters. Before we get going today though, this video is sponsored by Lexar. If you need fast, reliable and high quality memory cards, look no further than Lexar. Whenever I talk about this subject, there's always those who say, ignore the haters. This I think is generally good advice, but also the awkward truth is that sometimes they might have a point. And despite how it makes us feel, there may be something in there that we can learn from and that will make us better. So let's look at a few examples of things people have said to me. And this is not those occasions when people have just called me a knobhead. I just ignore those completely. It's more the ones that have a little poke at my ego as they occasionally become uncomfortably close to the truth. Hi Adam, it's been a while since I've commented on one of your videos, mainly because you've become a bit of a desk jockey and not out and about as much. Nothing wrong with that, just not my preference. <laughs> he then went on to say some nice things, but it probably is a fair assessment, at least in these videos. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, these indoor videos tend to perform better and take a lot less time to make. But more importantly, I think they're a better way to sort of share my thoughts and challenge ideas and discuss a philosophical approach to photography that I feel creates a much more interesting conversation than just a bog standard tutorial. The outdoor videos are also an extraordinary amount of work to make and churning them out week after week is very difficult. Secondly, from a photography point of view, I have still been going out just without making videos, but I've got to be honest that I've not really got back into the swing of things since all the lockdowns ended last year. I suspect many people feel like this at the moment and life generally just feels a bit like you're trying to walk through treacle and I'm finding it really difficult to get any momentum going and that's something I need. Certainly the cost of living doesn't help and either does my bad back. I am starting to feel that burn of motivation again though. And once we get the summer holidays out of the way, we head into that kind of September to February period, which is without doubt my favorite time for landscape photography with everything that the autumn brings. And hopefully some snowy scenes that are made for people built like me. Are you really making a living as a landscape photographer or YouTuber? This is an example of a comment I and others get a lot, where people seem to have a major problem with the success of some photographers on YouTube, particularly the suggestion that we are not proper. This maybe is one occasion where I should ignore the jealousy, the passive aggression and the haters, but it's not just about me. If say a young person wants to become a full-time landscape photographer, it could really help kick off their career by making videos. And I would hate anyone to be put off from giving it a go. Let's ask the question again. Are you really making a living as a landscape photographer or YouTuber? My answer to this would be, why are the two things separate? How many pro landscape photographers also deliver workshops, tours, education, talks, books, and prints on top of some commercial work? Most of them, if not all. That's certainly been my experience working with some of the best in the business. Now I do all of these things, but have added an additional line of revenue with YouTube videos. It's also an enjoyable creative outlet that gives me the ability to connect with you. And with marketing, I'm afraid it's just a game of numbers and attention. And this platform provides a great opportunity for that. Another slightly longer comment that you can see here did raise a more valid point about how many pro landscape photographers have representation. I work with several agencies now and again, but I don't have an agent and I'm not represented and this is how I want it to remain. It's mostly because I want to have total control over what I'm doing, but more importantly, I don't get much fulfillment when the goal of my work is to create a piece 
of advertising or marketing material. And that shouldn't be taken as any kind of criticism of full-time commercial photographers because I have a lot of respect for them and they make a lot more money than I do. I feel YouTube is still a relatively new line of revenue, especially in the landscape photography space. And the industry, I think, is itself changing. It gives the opportunity though to create images and artwork, tell stories and entertain in a way that maybe wasn't possible before. And I find that exciting. And if you're watching this, you almost certainly already understand this. Now I wanted to include something about gear because the amount of upset caused over gear in the photography world is very confusing to me. It's just really about having the right tool for the job. So I thought what I would do is just share why as a pro landscape photographer in 2022, I'm still using the Canon 5D Mark IV. And any criticism I receive about gear anyway is easily ignored. I was asked a while back, why did you switch over from Canon? This was a comment left on one of my videos I did reviewing a Fujifilm camera. And for a while, I very seriously considered switching, but in the end, I never did. What a lot of landscape photographers say, including me in the past, is that image quality is the absolute top priority because we want the finest detail possible to capture all those lovely textures and colors. But whilst this is extremely important to me, I've come to realize that it's not my top priority. I think it's probably about third on my list. My top priority, without doubt, is usability. And within this, I'd include things like ergonomics, weather sealing and reliability. When you buy a top-end camera, this is what you are paying for. It still amazes me when you're on a job and the pressure's on how often gear goes wrong. And I find it seems to happen way more often with consumer gear. It's just not something you wanna have to deal with. The next one on my list is cost. What is a new camera going to provide me that the Canon 5D Mark IV does not? And if there is something, is it going to be worth spending close to 10,000 pounds on a new camera and a bag of lenses? Is it going to add that much value to my business? I think the answer is probably not, at least in the short term. This Canon 5D Mark IV still has excellent image quality though, and the resolution, which I think is about 30 megapixels, is still enough to have lots of detail when printed in A2, which is the size most of my print sales come in. It also is one of the most reliable cameras I've ever used, and it's literally never let me down. And I put it through absolutely everything. Also, I think the ergonomics of Canon cameras are pretty much unrivaled. And anyway, if ever I'm gonna do a job that requires a bigger re resolution for large prints like that, I can just borrow or hire one. <laughs> so that has all been true up to now. But I mean, I'm very much considering switching to the Canon R5 after I tried it out last year. It felt to me like a very natural upgrade. And over time it would, I think, possibly pay off. Also, apart from it being lighter to carry around, I can't stop thinking about that dreamy 4K 120 frame per second slow motion footage. And when it snows again, that is the camera absolutely that I want to have with me. We've got two more to look at, but before we move on to the next one, as you know, this video is sponsored by Lexar. Now I've been using Lexar cards for years and they have never let me down. Even when I have clumsily bashed them around, and accidentally even drown them in a Welsh lake. They are fast, they are reliable, and they are high quality, and they make cards to suit all of our needs. One of my favorites is this one, it's the Lexar Professional 1800X. It does exactly what you want from a memory card. You just stick it in, and then you start taking pictures, and you can just forget about it because they come in a range of capacities. It's fast for all your 4K footage and high burst rate stills, and has very solid performance. So hit the link down below and check out the Lexar Professional 1800X, and yeah, give them some love for supporting this channel. How hypocritical, you lament the use of ad-driven content, yet you choose to place mid-roll ads in your video, sad face. <laughs> this was said in response to part of a video on that I did the other week, where I indeed was critical of the ad-driven revenue model. To whoever this person is, you're allowed to be critical of a system you are part of. It would only be hypocrisy if I was sort of saying to other people that they should not run ads 
which of course I'm not. You may have noticed that all my videos are now sponsored and that is because there is no such thing as free content. These videos are not free to create and the money it's got to come from somewhere. That is either advertising or it means paying for content. I offer both options. So if you want ad free content from me, then feel free to subscribe to The Raw Room. The recent economic climate and Netflix figures show though that people don't really want to pay for content. If you're also then not willing to accept ads, then essentially you're asking the creative people to work for free. And I'm afraid that is not how this works. <laughs> One way of dealing with criticism is to sometimes just put your ego aside and applaud the fact that they got you good. I posted a YouTube short the other day of me playing the piano and I titled it, Pro Photographer Does Average Piano Playing. One guy replied, Pro Cop Does Average Photography and Mediocre Piano. I found this funny because he obviously watches me enough to know that I used to be a cop. And that's kind of a, the deep cut trolling where you can really appreciate the effort. I told him that and it turned in to a fun little interaction. I honestly don't care what someone thinks of my photography though. And I always follow the rule of one where if one person likes or dislikes it, someone else will too. This alone makes it very easy to share my pictures because you will never please everyone. I am, however, very grateful for all the praise I do receive and your comments mean a lot. Then when someone puts their money where their mouth is to buy a book or a print, it's especially nice. Definitely part of dealing with criticism though is to not take yourself too seriously and especially not let your ego get out of control, especially if you're experiencing some success. If the advice though is to ignore the haters, then I feel it's also important to ignore much of the praise as well because if you start to believe your own hype, then usually that does not lead your personality or creativity anywhere good. My favorite way to deal with criticism has led to this video. Take and absorb that negativity, do some alchemy and use it as fire to then put out positive and creative energy. Be that change, praise and celebrate the success of others. Be curious, be open-minded and encourage people to share their work. In photography and in life, I truly believe that the good will out, but it's not always easy and we can't let them win. We can't let them win. <laughs> right, so I hope you enjoyed that. If you want some more photography motivation, why not watch this video here? Or if you want a landscape photography adventure out and about taking pictures, try this video here. And I'll see you again very, very soon. Bye.